there's pop, there's usually money. And some people in the pop business have never been too worried about how they get hold of it. There have been fake hit parade charts and record plugging. Not infrequently, pop groups have fallen out with the law. The latest fad to hit the pop world is bootlegging. The illegal production of records of music by top groups by backstreet manufacturers. These illegal records are made from tapes secretly recorded at live concerts by well-known groups. At big pop festivals, the audience can number thousands, and it's all too easy for someone, somewhere in the crowd, to record the music with a hidden tape recorder. Or, if he's more sophisticated, the illegal record manufacturer can somehow get hold of unreleased tapes from record companies. Either way, records are being produced and sold without the artist knowing, or getting paid. Bootleg albums like these cost about three pounds each. A few weeks ago, they were being sold under the counter like dirty books. Today, they're now being sold openly. I spent a day visiting record shops in the West End. In Carnaby Market, Beak Street, the record counter blares out bootleg music throughout the day. Progressive discs of Marlborough Court claim to undercut their rivals with cheaper bootleg records. The Carnaby Record Centre of Newborough Street even include a bootleg top ten in their window. Seen and heard of Oxford Street slipped me a furtive bootleg version of Jimi Hendrix from a locked case, but gave the game away by putting it in their own bag. Virgin Records, just over the road, weren't so shy. They display their selection of bootlegs all over the shop, and their manager talked openly about the illegal side of their business. Is the, is the profit margin on, on bootleg records uh, larger or smaller than, for it example, the ordinary? larger than ordinary records. Mm -hmm. why, why is that? Because of the danger involved, I suppose, basically. So what do you mean, danger? Well, they are virtually illegal. Obviously. How do you buy them? Why well, you get people coming into the shop with them. They offer them to you, just contacts that you make being in the record business, you know, mm -hmm. it's the same as anything else. And it's presumably cash over the counter, is it? Oh yes, it's all cash basis. No invoices at all? No. Mm -hmm. The big record companies are obviously worried. Bootleg albums of their artist's music cost them money in lost royalties and sales of legitimate recordings. But it affects our artists very considerably in long term. Uh, if bootlegging logically progressed to a very large degree, uh, it would cut into our normal sales. As a record company, we have to look at it from that point of view. From the artist, songwriter, uh, everybody who's concerned in the making of a record, um, it's piracy. Uh, they're not getting paid for something which they've done, and uh, very genuinely, they have a grievance. At the moment, the bootleggers only steal the music of top groups, the groups who sell the most. Peter Grant is manager of the Led Zeppelin. We found bootleg albums of his group easy to buy in the West End. How much money do you think you've lost personally, and the group too, from, from the activities of, of people who've bootlegged your, your records? Well, I would think altogether between 150 and 200 thousand dollars. Have you actually caught anybody recording your group at a live concert? And it's in Germany. In Germany at a concert. And I think it was Munich, and they were recording it there. And uh, what well, wasn't a very good sort of attempt, it was sort of microphones on broomsticks stuck up in the air, you know, that could be seen from the stage, and they were confiscated their equipment. And I think the police arrested them. So these bootleggers are using very crude equipment, in fact. Well, here, but not in America. In America, the Blueberry Hill album, the double Led Zeppelin album that was recorded in Los Angeles in the forum. That was recorded by uh, radio transmitters, you know, that pick up the signal as the concert's going on in the hall, and that's transmits outside to a mobile recording truck with a very, very good equipment in. When we asked one record shop how we could get tapes of a Rolling Stones concert produced as bootleg albums, we were told to go to a record shop at 88 Chantry Lane. There we'd meet the bootleg king. Later, we met Jeffrey Collins, a short, energetic 30-year-old who spent half his life in the record business. 
but it's only in the last few months that he's hit the jackpot by selling bootlegs alongside his legitimate records. Here in King Street, Hammersmith, he's just opened his seventh record shop. Behind it, he's now building a cash and carry warehouse, a mail order center, and a recording studio. Bootleg records are sold by many people. Um, some are manufactured in, uh, in England, but most of them are manufactured abroad, shipped over to England and sold by different people. Um, Do you manufacture records as well? No, no, we act solely as distributor or distributors to other retail outlets, and we sell them in our retail shops. I mean, just how do you distribute bootleg records? Because after all, it is illegal. Not illegal in a criminal sense, although occasionally we find that we are infringing upon copyrights. What does Led Zeppelin manager Peter Grant do when he finds bootleg recordings of his group? Well, I personally go and confiscate the records. And how do you do that? walk in and take them. You mean they just hand them over the counter to you just like that? Well, they don't hand them over the counter exactly, but you can take them. Do some of the groups employ heavies to... Uh, well, they're not going to get anybody heavier than me, are they? The Led Zeppelin manager, I don't have to mention his name. Peter Grant. Correct. <laughs> he came to... big man. He came to see me and he... Uh, um, rather indignant that um, I shouldn't sell any Led Zeppelin bootlegs. I think at the time there was one bootleg in particular of Led Zeppelin which wasn't very good at all and he was rather upset that this was on the market. But so what did he do? He just warned me not to handle Led Zeppelin bootlegs which I haven't bothered to do so. The Pink Floyd manager, I knew him f uh, from days when I was in the agency business and um, I called him and asked him if he thought the group would mind if a bootleg record was on the market, as I'd been offered some. Um, he was quite thrilled at the idea that Pink Floyd had a bootleg record on the market and said that if there was any complaints, he'd let me know. And I haven't heard from him since. Well, I can't remember talking to this uh, skeezer <laughs> at all. Um, no, it's not true at all. Obviously, I wouldn't be happy about a bootleg album coming out, at least by anybody. And if the guy comes on to me, um, I'll either attempt to tape his conversation, or I'll certainly find out more about him, get his name and address anyway. If you've got it, I'd be very happy to take it off you. We played a snatch of their bootleg album called Pinky. It was the first time they'd heard it. What do you think of that? Compared with studio recordings, it, it is disgusting. And, I mean, he's just conning everybody or all the way along the line. that we could do if we chose, you know, yeah, chose if we to. chose a live recording, it would be of far superior quality than, than that. reactions weren't perhaps so surprising. Producing pop music today is sophisticated and expensive. The Pink Floyd's new album is costing more than £15,000 to produce. The stereo and balance had to be exactly right for the demanding tastes of their audiences. Bootlegs can not only damage their bank accounts, they can also affect a group's musical reputation. If bootleggers are to survive and prosper, they know they must improve the quality of their records. The most sophisticated kind of bootlegging is when the bootlegger gets hold of the original master tapes, like these master tapes here at the EMI studios in London. One way or another, he's got to steal it. When he gets hold of a master tape, he knows that the quality on his bootleg album will be much better than if, for example, he uses a snatch recording taken at an open-air concert. Now, this copy of a master track of the Beatles' Hey Jude 
cost £30,000 to produce. A copy of it was sold to a bootlegger for £1,000. He soon turned it into this, Judy, the illegal version of Hey Jude. Hey Jude. hey Jude was recorded by EMI for Apple Records, the Beatles' own company. The bootleggers on their album called themselves Custom Records and changed the song titles. Hey Jude became Judy Judy, Lady Madonna, Lady Mother, and Penny Lane, Copper Path. Now, where did you get the tapes from for this record, for example? As I say, I didn't. Um, I don't possess the tapes. The tapes were sent or bought in but America. But you did tell me earlier, in fact, that you got them from Apple illegally and no. then manufactured the record, put it on the market. No, the, t uh, the uh, tapes originally came from Apple, from the Apple Recording Studios, and they've been compiled together. So, in fact, they've been stolen? Uh, they've been borrowed. We did manufacture the covers, actually, because these records came from America um, unsleeved. And we manufactured um, a number of covers so that we could sell these records on the open market. But not everybody in the pop business is worried about bootlegging. Mrs Yoko Ono Lennon, for instance. It's very nice to see that people are stimulated enough to sort of bootleg it, I suppose. Yeah. But you don't mind that you're losing money yourself and your, your husband here, too? I'm sure we're losing money in all sorts of ways, you know. What does your husband think about bootlegging? Well, he prefers to be in a bag today, you know, for some reason or other. What do you think he thinks about uh, bootlegging? Part of the people. The only weapon the record companies have is the law. 4,000 bootleg records from this factory were handed over to be destroyed after Britain's first bootleg court case. In return, charges against this firm were dropped. The moles handed over to the record company's lawyers. The two men connected with the bootlegging were fined. One was Geoffrey Collins, fined £10 for five records he'd sold, plus £180 costs. Bootlegging is a criminal offence, and Collins was wrong when he told me that it wasn't. But the penalties are so low at present that bootleggers, who are often making enormous profits, are hardly likely to stop. They can be fined only two pounds for every record they sell, and only up to a maximum of 50 pounds. Until the law is tightened, illegal recordings are bound to go on.